If only there was an easier way to change the color of your walls. Hey wait, there is. It's called Photoshop and I want to use this opportunity to teach you guys exactly how to use Photoshop from start to finish. So buckle up, today we're going through a full length tutorial on Photoshop for architects. So today we are using Photoshop Beta version 25.7. It's just updating to the latest version right now and we're gonna dive straight in. What we wanna do is come across to new file and then select our artboard size. Personally, it doesn't really matter in this tutorial. Let's just go across to print. Let's select A4 as a typical paper size, rotate it on the right hand side orientation from portrait to landscape. Width, height, default A4 is great. Resolution, if you're printing 300 is perfect. If you're using it for digital, you wanna go down to 72 pixels per inch. For the purpose of this, let's leave it at 300 because maybe we'll print it, maybe we won't. Depending on how you print, what you print for, RGB is a typical media display, whereas CMYK is for your professional printers. That's not something you should worry about at the start. If it prints a bit funny, look at your color maps and color modes at the start. Let's leave the background as it is and click create. What you're gonna see open up is a blank white screen, A4, rotated landscape because that's exactly what you asked for. To get started, on the left-hand side, we have our main palette and our main toolbar. On the right-hand side, we have our palettes and our layers. Photoshop is just like ARCHICAD. It has layers, it has folders, and you can turn them on and off as you see fit. Up the top is our standard menu bar, and there's a couple items that we wanna go into a little bit later on. For now, we don't need to go into them, but we will as the tutorial progresses. So as architects, there's generally a lot of things that we do, but most of the time we're manipulating and editing photos. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's import an image. Two ways, you can either drag and drop it and then scale it to an A4 size, or you can hit the little import image button down below. I've gone ahead, dragged and dropped an image into our scene. We'll see it slowly open up and load. Now, we have the frame open up, showing us that we are able to scale it. There are a number of ways to scale an image in Photoshop. First of all, we can select one corner and slowly drag it in. We can select one side and it will drag it in, in equal parts. If you don't want to drag it in equal parts, if you, you can hold the shift button and it will scale the image depending on the node you're selecting. So if I'm going top down, it'll shrink it that way. If I'm going diagonal, it will do whichever mouse movement I want. Now for me, I don't like any of that. Undo, undo, Command Z, of course. And then I've got to zoom out a little bit. So by holding the Option key on your keyboard and scrolling out on your mouse, you can zoom in and out of the actual artboard. What I want to do is hold the Option button again, select one of the nodes and drag it out all the way evenly in the image. This way we can drag it out evenly and then press enter. It'll create that image in the center and it'll create a new layer on the right hand side in our layers palette. Now it's up to us how we structure our layers, how we structure our folders. Let's say we want to structure a basic folder. Down the bottom, you'll see the little folder icon. You can click on that and it'll create a group. By double clicking on the group, we can rename it. Let's call it background image for now and then drag and drop that image into the background. If I toggle that layer group on and off, it will do exactly that. Now there are a couple of things we might wanna do with this image. Maybe we wanna test out a few options. And in that instance, we probably need to keep our original. So if we hold the option button again, or Alt if you're on Windows, click and drag, it'll create a copy of that background image. Double click and let's go option one. Now we can turn off our background image as our backup in case we need to go back to it. And we can open up our option one. To be able to edit this freely, what I like to do is press Command A to select everything, then Command C to copy everything, and then Command Shift V to paste a duplicate file that isn't a smart object or an imported PNG. So now we have our base with this little logo and we have our layer one without the logo. The first thing we wanna do is delete the original base. We don't need it, we don't want it, we wanna keep layer one. Layer one is great because it gives us so much freedom and flexibility. Now Photoshop has introduced some AI tech which we'll talk about towards the end, but I still wanna teach you exactly how to do things so that you know later down the track. Let's start with some simple basic manipulation and adjustments. So for instance, we might want to move this car over or we might wanna delete it entirely or potentially we wanna move this car on the left or delete it entirely. Let's start by attempting to remove this car 
the manual way and then showcasing the AI way. So Photoshop has some incredible features. Up the top, you're gonna see your magic wand tool. If you don't, you can right click and select the quick selection tool or the object selection tool. Either or will work for this activity. Let's go to the quick selection tool, zoom in by holding option and scrolling on our wheel to our little car down the bottom and then click and drag over the car itself. Up the top, we wanna to make sure that we have our plus symbol selected for our paintbrush, which means we can then continue to add more highlighted area or selected area. Otherwise, if you have just the first brush tool, it'll deselect the car and reselect whatever you paint the next time around. You can of course minus items as well on the right hand side here. So that way we could paint away the actual shadow and then come back to the plus try add it again and so on or alternatively you can hold the option button so that you can unpaint and repaint freely so let's paint out this car option away all the extra bits and try get our smaller parts here two ways to increase and decrease our brush size of course you can come up the top and slowly decrease the brush size until you're happy alternatively you can use the parentheses or bracket icon on your keyboard open bracket makes it smaller close bracket makes it bigger up to you guys how you use it and then you can slowly just paint in and out more objects until you're happy with the selection of that vehicle Multiple other ways, of course, you could have used that magic wand tool and just kept clicking until all of that car was selected or increasing your tolerance up the top from 30 to 50. So the same color that you click on, it expands its tolerance. The problem with that is once you click on a black part, for example, there, you start adding all the shadows, all the extra parts you don't want to. And last but not least, you could have also used the polygonal lasso tool up the top, right click for some alternative options like the magnetic lasso tool, and you could have started to click once and slowly drag around, clicking as you need to select the outline of this specific car. The magnetic lasso tool does a pretty decent job at clinging to parts, but you'll see even down here, it's missed the edge of that bumper. So if we backspace a couple times, it will delete those nodes. We can click in the problematic parts and then allow it to do its thing where it knows it's really working well. We still wanna go pretty close to the edge of that car so the software doesn't get confused. Click and end. Now that we've selected the car, we can go ahead and hit the delete button and it will just simply delete it. It'll remove it completely and entirely from our image and we just have a blank white space. Alternatively, we could have tapped the V button on our keyboard which activates the move tool so that we can just simply move this car around and adjust it. So let's say we wanted to move it back here and make it a little bit smaller. We could click, drag, move across, press the command T button for Tomich to activate the transform tool. And then we can continue to scale it as we see fit. So let's say we wanted to scale it all the way up here till it's somewhere about there. Press enter, press command D to deselect and we've moved our car. Of course, we have a very annoying blank white space, however. So what we wanna do is press the S button on the keyboard, S for Sam, to activate our clone stamp tool. The clone stamp tool is great. It allows you to basically magically paint away any items that you don't want using existing elements in the actual image. So to be able to paint this car away, we would have to select areas of shadow and areas of driveway. So for example, if I press the option button on a shadow and then come back here, I can start to paint away this blank white space. Now you see, as you move your cursor, that blank white space isn't always there. Sometimes it goes to green because it uses where you've selected when pressing the option button as your starting point. So if I was to start here on this tree, hold option, click once, move across to my car white space and then start painting, you'll see on the screen I'm painting the trees, but there's also a secondary cursor of where that reference paint is coming from. So now I'm just painting away this tree and bring it over across. Obviously that's not what we want. It's not useful to us, but it's just demonstrating exactly how this paintbrush tool works. So command Z, command Z to undo. Option click into the shadows, paint away. Option click in the driveway, add some more paint and repeat the process until you've painted away 
all of the white space. Once you've painted away all the white space, you'll end up with something looking like this. A big hole of where the shadow used to be, the car moved away, and generally something that seems acceptable unless you zoom in and actually look at the poor textured pattern. Now, like I mentioned before, AI has gotten really good and Photoshop has some incredible AI software to make our life so much easier. What used to take 15 minutes to move cars, adjust bits and pieces, now takes a matter of seconds. So let's turn off our option one. Let's duplicate our background layer once again, call it option two and turn it on. Now, instead of highlighting that car and trying to paint it out, Let's use our lasso tool. Simply click around the car, close the lasso, generative fill and hit generate. Let Photoshop do its thing. And on the right hand side, it'll provide you with three variations of that car removed. Now, sometimes Photoshop will interpret what you want perfectly without you typing a prompt, usually when you want to remove something. Other times it'll just mess it up. So you're gonna have to try again or add some prompts. In this instance, there's three variations. Personally, I think variation two is probably perfect for us and it's created a new layer for us as well. So we can toggle that layer on and off to see that car in action or disappeared. As an example, if we wanted to compare the pair, let's turn that generative fill on and turn off option one. We can see option one and option two, very similar, but option two is significantly better in terms of the patchiness, in terms of the realistic reference point provided by the AI. So just quickly now, we've learned exactly how to highlight a car, how to mark it, how to move it, how to scale it, and how to brush it out. All of these skills can be used for basically anything in this image or in any other image for that matter. The same principles apply to including new objects into the image. So let's say we wanted to add another tree. We went onto Google, went tree PNG, found a tree that we like. Let's say we like this one. Save it to our downloads, go back to Photoshop, drag and drop that tree in. We can scale it using the same principles we learned before. Let's place it behind this car over here. Press enter. We can copy and paste the tree so we can manipulate it freely. We can use our lasso tool around this car to cut out the extra bits we don't need and then simply hit delete. Activate our eraser tool with the command E button or selecting on the left hand side and erase just those extra little pieces. And there we go, we've got a tree scaled into our project very quickly. The tree doesn't really match the ambience of this design. And we can go through and play with the saturation, play with the colors, or we can come up to image, adjustments, and then match color. So now that we have the match color palette open up, we can select our source, which is Untitled 1, the Photoshop file name in this instance, and then change our layer. We wanna use layer two as the background image. Now, a couple of things will happen. First of all, it'll go a really weird color. First, we wanna neutralize, and then we wanna slowly adjust our fade. The fade is gonna fade the colors and blend it a little bit more seamlessly. And we wanna adjust our color intensity and our luminance until we're relatively happy with the blend and then simply hit okay. So now we have a tree that looks like it belongs in the scene, all the colors match and it is perfectly blended in. If we move it, you can see by copying and pasting, we've cropped out all of the extra parts of the tree and it is not really usable in anywhere else except that instance here. But let's say the sky in this architectural render is looking a bit average. It's not the best, it might not be the right color, it might not be the right shade, it might not be moody enough for you, whatever that might be. So let's go back to our layer two. Let's go to edit and sky replacement. In a matter of seconds, Photoshop will identify the sky and automatically replace it for you. Now you can see it's over expand the sky a little bit, but we can touch that up in a few seconds. If you wanna change the sky to something different, just go to the drop down menu, have a look at what options are available to you, select a different sky and it will try again. As you can see, it'll also adjust all of the foreground and background colors to match the intensity sky. And if you wanted to, you can always add your own HDRI skies too. If you need to, you can manipulate and adjust all of these settings here to either increase or decrease the temperature of the background image, but just have a play, see what works best for you. Then you can press okay and it'll create all of the new layers for the sky replacement. If we select the sky, but select the masking tool on the right hand side where it's a black and white image, 
we can start to actually paint out or crop out the house itself. So if we use our polygonal lasso tool again, and then simply trace around the outside of this house, which in this instance is very easy because it's very rectangular, just predominantly where the sky has overimposed itself over the building. Now, by making sure we're still on that mask layer, we can go to our brush tool or hit the B for brush, activate our black and white color palette. By simply clicking on the black and white mini version, it will automatically divert you back to black and white. Black and white in this instance is your paint and de-paint or unpaint versions of the select tool. Alternatively, you can just hit delete if you wanna get rid of it all. But in this instance, when you have the white picker activated, it'll actually paint in more of the sky. However, when you press the X button to swap these two or hit the little swap button up the top, you can start painting out the sky. So you can see as I'm painting, that sky that's overimposed itself on the actual building is slowly being painted away. Now that would take too long. I would personally just hit the delete button whilst the white color was activated and then command D to deselect. Now, if we wanna see how far we've come, simply toggle on and off from our background original reference image. And you'll see it's a very different image, different vibe, but we're learning the basics of Photoshop here. Now we've learned how to move cars, how to remove cars, how to add objects, how to change their colors and their saturations to match background objects, how to change the sky and how to manipulate the photo in itself. There's a few extra bits and pieces that we wanna be able to do as architects in Photoshop, which is predominantly what we do with Photoshop. We don't have to extend ourselves to learning all of the expertise elements in this, but these are generally the most used features. So after this, maybe we'll wanna adjust some of the colors in this base layer. So let's select image two, go to image adjustments, and let's go to hue and saturation. This is one of the most common elements in color management. And if you've ever used Lightroom before, if you've ever taken a photo, it is some basic stuff. We have the hue and saturation palette open. We can change our master. Let's go to our greens, for instance. Now we can desaturate our greens completely, or we can increase the saturation. You'll see what it's picking up as greens. It's mainly some reflections, some shadows, and all of those extras. If you don't wanna work your way through the colors, you can simply just hover over the image anywhere, click, and it will activate those same parameters on the greens itself. So now we've desaturated the grass, we've desaturated all these plants, and we're making the colors pop a little bit more. So now we can increase and play with it however we see fit. Once we click okay, that is embedded into that image. We can't just replace that grass. So be cautious when you go to edit adjustment because it will not make another layer. We can repeat the same for that tree so that it begins to match our actual image and press okay. Now let's say we wanna do something opposite to the sky. We click on the sky, image adjustment, let's go brightness and contrast. In this instance, we can simply increase the brightness increase the contrast or decrease the contrast however we see fit to make that sky the way we like it. Pressing OK, edit adjustments, hue and saturation. We can now go to those blues and the cyans, decrease the saturation, decrease the lightness and adjust it accordingly. Press OK when we're happy and now we've also adjusted our hue and saturation, our brightness and our contrast. Now one of the last things we do in architectural editing in Photoshop is add some motion, add some blur to the vehicles and to pedestrians. So this, what appears to be a Range Rover at the front of the image, let's select that Range Rover, copy and paste it a little bit further back and then move it so we have a new layer. Now, I wanna get the Erase tool. I wanna to increase it by closing the parentheses or closing the bracket, right clicking to open my brush styles. I wanna use the soft round brush, not the hard round brush. For instance, the hard round brush is just gonna create hard edges wherever I click and paint. Whereas the soft round brush is going to feather away briefly, which is exactly what I want. I wanna be able to feather and blend these two images together as best as I can, and then move them closer together. Now that they're a little bit abstract to say the least, we can go up top to filter, blur, motion blur, set our angles up so they align approximately with the angle of the car and then increase and decrease our distance until we're happy with a little bit of motion blur. Then press okay and we have motion blur activated on that car. 
Anyway, that's all from me, team. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. We're about 85% of the way through with the painting of the house. Next week, I'm hoping to be back to regular programming back in the office. So stay tuned for that. Smash the subscribe button. And like always, I'll see you next week.